Today I'd like to share some thoughts on the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, who is considered to be the father of existentialism. Uh, Kierkegaard lived from 1813 to 1855 uh, in Denmark. He was uh, born to a fairly wealthy family. His father was a trader and uh, very uh, affluent. And he pursued really the idea of the importance of the individual finding her or his own truth. And so very much uh, his philosophy was concentrated on the subjective aspect of the search of the individual. Uh, he was engaged to Regine Olsen, who uh, was the dominant figure in his life in terms of male-female relationships. He got uh, engaged to Regine, but he felt that he himself was not suitable to marriage, so he broke off the engagement. Uh, he said he had too melancholy a spirit to really be a good partner uh, in a marriage. Uh, but it's interesting uh, when you realize that uh, he still had this affection for Regine throughout his entire life. And as a matter of fact, uh, with his will, uh, she was the single beneficiary of his estate. Uh, so obviously he had a great deal of affection for her, even though he thought getting married uh, was not the way to go. He was able to do pretty well for himself with his family's inheritance. When his father died, uh, he got a nice inheritance. And so he really never had to work. He spent most of his time studying, uh, getting his degree, getting his master's degree, and also publishing a lot uh, of books, which he always published under a, a different name and uh, would frequently change those names. So one of the uh, challenges of those who study the works of Kierkegaard is to find out what did he actually write, because the names are, are, are all different. Uh, but it, again, you can pick it up from the, his style of writing. His thought was that God comes to each person uh, individually. And so we have that one-to-one -one relationship with God. Uh, he said it's not necessary really to try to uh, prove Christianity and try to get all these logical things set up and say, well, this is why you must be a Christian. He said that's not really what it's all about. Uh, it involves a leap of faith that when it comes to being a believer in God and Christianity and following Jesus and the Gospels, that individual has to find something within herself or himself that resonates and, and say, you know, I'm going to believe in this. Uh, this is something that, that speaks to me, that speaks to my heart, that speaks to my soul. And so that leap of faith was important. It seems to come down uh, in terms of his fundamental experience in life to an experience that he had during Holy Week in 1848 when he experienced this direct communication of Christianity, when he really sensed during that time exactly what Christianity was all about, what faith was all about, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And he says the, the thing is not really to know the truth intellectually, but really to be the truth and to embody the truth. And in order to do that, it's very important that we be silent. Uh, a lot of times he felt there's too much distraction out there and we really have to concentrate on the importance of, of being silent and being reflective. Uh, one of his most famous works was his attack though, upon Christianity. And what he really felt was that uh, the Christianity in Denmark had become too intertwined with the state uh, in the sense that the ministers were paid by the state. They, they were kind of officials of the state. And he felt that this was wrong, that this was bad for, for Christianity. And what it tended to do was to take away the demanding aspect of Christianity, the importance of really making this decision for Christ and embodying what Christianity was all about. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're just involved in terms of increasing the size of your congregation, and that's your main focus, uh, your Christianity is not really going to be uh, as demanding uh, upon the individual as, as it really should be.
what, what he saw was Christianity becoming fashionable. Uh, it became kind of part of the culture and uh, it lost its really aspect of the call of, of giving up all uh, and in that sense following Jesus completely without reservation. Uh, it became too much part of the Danish culture uh, and not enough challenging the, that culture. Uh, he used a, a phrase the, where the Christianity of his time became a collection of unbelieving believers. So they were believers in, in a fashionable sense, believers in that they would go to church and support the church, but uh, not really seeing what Christianity was all about, what the teachings of Jesus really meant. And it's very interesting that uh, at his funeral, his nephew got up and said, you know, this is not what Kierkegaard would have wanted. He wouldn't have wanted this type of thing. He was against this. Uh, this was too much, just, you know, the, the pro forma religion. It didn't really emphasize a religion of the heart and a call to follow Christ. So his, his nephew, Heinrich Lund, got up and said, no, this is not what he wants. And uh, Lund was actually fine for disturbing the service. He had to be kind of calmed down uh, at the service. Uh, but, but afterwards, after the death of Kierkegaard, a lot of his teachings about the importance of that individual relationship with God and the importance of challenging ourselves to be better in our lives, that really did have an effect on a lot of the writers and uh, church leaders who came after uh, Kierkegaard. Now, when we look at his life, though, there are some negative aspects that we have to kind of take into consideration and, and discuss. Uh, he criticized, for example, the suffragette movement, he didn't think that women should have the right to vote. Uh, he was also kind of against the natural sciences. Um, he argued against democracy and in favor of the monarchy, uh, was against the media, uh, held anti-Semitic views, and he did not speak out against slavery. Um, and very interestingly, uh, his father seems to have been somewhat involved in the slave trade. So not only did he not speak out against it uh, in his life, he actually benefited from that in a material way. <clears throat> so, you know, that, that you kind of wonder in terms of, of uh, his overall uh, in engagement with Christianity in terms of why didn't it affect more his views on some of these issues. Uh, also, he very much wanted to be accepted by the Danish literary establishment at the time. Uh, yet he wrote about not getting involved in the trivial concerns uh, of everyday life. So here he was saying, you know, there's a lot of nonsense that's going on here, a lot of trivia. Don't get involved in that. Uh, follow a different path. But yet he himself frequently would get involved in some of these concerns. What can we say in conclusion overall? Um, we see very much an emphasis on the individual and the importance of that individual decision and that individual leap of faith in Kierkegaard. But what about the challenges of Christianity in terms of social justice? Uh, when we think of religion, we think of the two elements. Uh, we think of love of God, we think of love of neighbor would seem with Kierkegaard, there was this emphasis on love of God and relationship with God, but yet in terms of the neighbor, in terms of that love of neighbor, in terms of the impact that we should have on society to make society more just, that seems to be kind of missing in his, his work uh, here. Uh, his work, Attack Upon Christendom, uh, we could turn it around and say, is there and should there be an attack upon Kierkegaard, was he too complicit with the social values of his time? Uh, and did he not see the importance in our faith of standing up for justice?